our big treat today is to, uh, first of all, to be here in this, in this wonderful hall. Um, we're going to hear more about that later on. Uh, we're delighted to be in Canterbury uh, and in this particular hall. Uh, we know that it's just been renovated and uh, only just made the carpet. The last carpet was laid out there yesterday afternoon. <laughs> so, delighted to be here and I'm particularly delighted that um, our first event of our convention uh, is to hear the president of Civic Voice, uh, Griff Rees Jones. Griff is known to you uh, very well, wearing all sorts of different hats. Uh, today, uh, Griff is coming to us as our president and as a, a, a very strong campaigner uh, for all sorts of causes, particularly those that are important to the civic society movement. So, um, I'm going to shut up now. I'm going to hand over to Griff. Um, but just let me say, delighted to see so many of you here and looking forward to a great presentation from Griff. Thanks. Good morning. Um, can you all hear me at the back? Yes. That's good, great. Because I, I like to, I mean, I'm a little bit flustered. I apologise for that. Um, and <laughs> a little bit unprepared. Uh, <laughs> because they only told me I was doing this six months ago. So, uh, <laughs> so what is all that? Welcome to the AGM. And I know this isn't even the beginning. This is only the sort of like the precursor. This is only the full play for the AGM, which actually gets down to business tomorrow. So this is just a sort of meeting, and I'm, it's wonderful that we're here. I have to say also that I, it was my intention to come back. I, you know, years ago, I used to produce Frankie Howard. I was his junior producer when I first arrived at the BBC. And uh, I was very honoured to be invited to, a, to a, a lunch given by the Variety Club. And to my astonishment, um, J.B. Priestley was there. J.B. Priestley at the time was about 85, the human man of Frankie Howard, and he was making one of his last appearances. And uh, he, was, he was going to give an address about Frankie Howard. And uh, the time came, and he had to get up from his chair, and we all, a very large audience, were sort of already getting a little bit nervous because it took him a very long time to get to the He stood there. Fitzrovia, which is an inner city area 
of bubble. That, I mean, you couldn't get much more inner-city rather brought up, principally in Epping, which seemed like a great distance from the centre of London. And because of that, because I was brought up in the suburbs, it always had been my ambition to live on a bollard in Oxford Street, <laughs> to try you know, to sort of get as close as I possibly could to living in the centre of town. And I remember when I first moved in to Fitzroy, now this is a long preamble and we'll come back to what I mean in a minute. When I first moved in there, I remember waking up suddenly, uh, my children were 11 and 13, and I woke up sort of like a minute I went, what am I doing? What am I doing? Bring my children into the centre of vice and horror, in, right in the middle of town. Uh, you know, we, we, at the time we were living out uh, in, in Islington, and I thought, I've bought a house, I'm going to move into the centre of right and down a few yards away from Soho. As it happens, I sat down with my children and going to walk through Soho. My son was going to school in Westminster, and he would walk back and forth. And I sat down, I sat down, and I said, look, George, you know, I just have to say, you know what? How would you, you know, if you're walking home one day and your friends said to you, um, let's pop into Soho and spend uh, an afternoon, you know, instead of going playing football, you know, playing on the slot machines, what, what would you say? And he said, well, I'd never do it. And I said, good, he said, I've got the money for that sort of thing. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, 
ordered and quiet suburbs and get in a transport <coughs> system which would take them into the centre of town and there they would do their work in a, in a dirty industrial place and then, they'd, and then they'd move to another area where they would shop and the shopping would be organised and transport would be specially uh, 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 laid on. And this Corbusian vision of us all jumping into cars and zooming around. I mean, it's sort of there in these 30s films that you see about that and the idea of what of what the world would be like in the future. Um, is, and it's there in California. Uh, we see it in some of the plans that we see in Brazil. Mm -hmm. These visions, 20th century visions, of what humanity, how humanity could be organised, were embraced hugely by the world of planners in the immediate post and what was interesting about that as well, I'm just making a program, or making a drama, about the foundations of the National Health Service. And also, in that, the, the story of Bevan. What's extraordinary about the post-war consensus, and Bevan walking in, and why he managed to build almost a million houses between 1945 and 1955. A huge house building. Why he managed to do that was because at that stage there was enormous faith in planning. What had happened during the Second World War was a consensus had arrived in the country. And that consensus was that something needed to be done. We were all in this together and we needed to get together. And a, a new generation of people who had had to plan a war, who had had to plan um, a, a whole series of services, who had to plan food for whole uh, uh, cities and for a whole populations of countries were actually in the driving seat. When Bevan arrived and said to them, let's get going, um, and look, you've got too comfortable a seat behind my desk. Let's get rid of this, let's get a nice hard seat, and let's get down. These civil servants, these planners, looked him in the eye and thought, this is one of us. And off they went, and they achieved something extraordinary. But it was extraordinary within the political climate and the consensus climate of the time. And it looked forward to a future which was based upon people's views of the future at that time. If people ask me about the conservation business today, and they say, you people, you live in the past. You're constantly talking about the idea of preserving old cities not allowing us to move forward to the future. My answer to that is, there are two reasons why I think we represent the future. One is because there is going to be change, and it's particularly true that what I'm trying to do in Fitzrovia, what I'm conscious of in Fitzrovia, in this inner city area, a slightly neglected area north of Oxford Street, is that there are a lot of community societies that exist there, and together they are in a bit of a state about change that's coming. They are actually disastrously slightly arguing amongst themselves. Nothing could be better for it that way. The idea that there is no consensus amongst the people who are sort of sitting opposite. One set of people in the Victorian society want one thing. I mean, I want to go to broker a meeting. <laughs> I've had to broker several meetings in the area that I live between different societies who were accusing the other society of not standing in the way of something happening, and the other society had 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 lumped down to and said it's okay. You know, what on earth is going on there? But what's interesting is that I believe that we need to say we're not just trying to stop. This development is going to happen. But we want this development to be mindful of the future. We want development to represent something that our grandchildren will be pleased to have seen happen. We are talking not about short-term economic emergency or economic gain, we're talking about the long-term future of our cities and what they mean. And that although there are sticking plasters that can go up, and although there are solutions as seen by by councils, by, by interested parties, by politicians, by the Treasury, which had a lot to do with untrammeled free development. 
There's also a responsibility that we have as a society to say, where are we going? What are we, not just are we preserving old cities properly and have we really paid enough attention to that corbel and are we using goat's hair in our plaster, but are we actually making a, an interesting and useful city for the future? Because anybody who lives in university, as we do, what's fascinating is people are making their choices and coming back to live in Fitzroy. Why are they doing this? They're doing it because a sprawling city faces problems, a growing city, London city, faces problems with its treatment system. And the idea that you could just live out in the suburbs and spend a lot of your time trundling back and forth into town to work um, is, is becoming an antiquated uh, uh, 20th century idea. Why, if I have friends who say, it's hell for me, I'm, the only way we can buy houses is in one city. And I, I'm also thinking, why do you, in the current climate, have to then get on a train and come in all the way into the centre of town because the office that you're working in is not located in Wanstead. The future, surely. We don't have to be a new urbanist. We don't have to subscribe to Prince Charles's sort of exact vision of, uh, 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 of the future. But there's enough thought going into this to, for us to question whether, if we're going to talk about green, whether the, uh, the, the old 20th century or 19th century notion of the city centre is even a value. And whether we actually ought to be looking back a little bit to the 17th century idea of a city centre, which is that people lived above the shop and worked near where their shop was. And that with these vast movements of humanity around every morning, to go to a town like Ipswich and be stuck in a queue going in and think, there's a rush hour? We need to switch. <laughs> As there have been. When I was a boy and I used to go to school in Britain, most of my journey was spent sitting in Mr. Dickinson's car and giving me a lift every morning as we sort of waited to make our way through the huge car jam that would make its way into the centre of Britain. And that still happens. And we're still doing it with towns. We're still ruled. We're still ruled, it seems to me, by concepts like traffic circulation. We're still ruled by concepts like shopping. We're not really ruled by what people want and what people enjoy and how they react to the environment that they live in or work in. These massive academic sort of slightly, they're very important to the future of any city that we live in or any urban environment that we live in are uh, these great concepts, these huge of fighting each other for dominance, but in the middle, the, the, the middle, the human being is sometimes completely squeezed out of this debate. And that's one of the reasons why I went, when I went to the Westminster Commission, to meet with them and talk, and invited me in as a resident to talk about, and one of the reasons I invited me in is because I've been a little bit vocal about the idea of a business improvement district where I live. I was a little bit suspicious of the idea that some of the smaller businesses were being faced with the idea that they would have huge rent increases because um, the uh, notion had been put about that I was living, we were living in an area of inner city decay which would be best improved if a lot of it was cleared out of the way, bigger shops were introduced and it was made into a bigger shopping area and I had to go and plead with the Westminster Council to say that, you know, this thing's quite, works quite well actually. We're a village, we're a community. We're a community that has some of the biggest engineering businesses have their offices there. We have uh, very important parts of, of the hospital service, but also huge, like Canterbury, very large numbers of students, temporary population living there. Which so we have a sort of extraordinary mix of things going on here. While I was sitting, waiting for the Westminster Commission to hear me, what was great was in uh, uh, front of me was, the, was a series of special interests. So the theatre, um, uh, the, the representative of the owners of the theatre got, got, got him to see Westminster Committee. He explained in some detail why not enough was being done for the theatres. Effectively, uh, a lot of what was there was not helping the theatre 
Yes. Then, the, then the, um, the representative of the taxi drivers came along, and the taxi drivers went, not enough was being done for the taxi driver to remain. Then the representative of uh, sandwich bars arrived. He explained, certainly not enough was being done for the sandwich bar. And what one felt as one listened to this is that I felt after a while I had to say, look, look, please, my only issue is that we all have to live together. There is no one magic bullet. It's not turning every place into a sandwich bar or making sure that every street has a theatre on it and every theatre is given better access than everybody else. What we have to do is try and find a way together of moving forward to some form of live and let live, some form of mixed idea, some form of understanding why in the first place this area is working, what its success is, and managing the change that that success will bring upon it. Because of course the West End is a successful area. The idea that somehow what's necessary there, it's come from the very highest areas of London, it's come from the mayor himself. Not this mayor, but the mayor before arriving and saying, this is an area where we can have much more density and let's build more skyscrapers. Whoa, whoa! Hold on! You've never been here before, mate! What are you doing deciding from your centralised podium that this is what should happen to this area? This area is not your toy to play with to sort out some of your major problems, you have to listen and understand what an area is. And to understand what an area is, what makes it successful, and what actually makes offices in the West End the most expensive in the world, it's not a question then, this is, like, this is a sort of Broadway 19, um, or Wall Street 19, uh, 18, 1890 theory. In, 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 in Wall Street, the reason why there are skyscrapers on Wall Street and in New York. It's got nothing to do with the shortage of land on Manhattan and everything to do with the shortage of offices on Wall Street. Now we could say, okay, in the solution, but that's why they're starting to build up, 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 because every office needed an address which said Wall Street. So up, 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 and you've got more and more addresses on Wall Street. Similarly, in Fitzrovia, you could come into Fitzrovia and say, yeah, we can allow everybody to have an office in Wall Street <coughs> if we knock down what's there and build a new Manhattan in Wall Street. But my point is, we have areas in London <coughs> and we have approached areas in London where such a policy is a good idea and it's working well and it's worked in parts of Dublin. And we're looking at Canary Wharf and I don't know, I'm a person who says, go ahead, let's have areas where you go and let's build to the sky. Let's build the biggest um, and highest uh, uh, skyscrapers we can to create a new area of demand at offices. Whether businesses will work to want to do that, or whether they'll still want to congregate in Wall Street or the city, as you know, there's a fight going on. You may not know, there's a fight going on between the city and Canary Wharf. It's one of the reasons why they're licensing new offices being built. It's not, not really a simple sense of let's develop sensibly or plan properly, but the, the Corporation of London, uh, the city, doesn't want businesses to move out of the city. Um, and therefore, every time Canary Wharf puts up another town, they put up that. <laughs> now, in a funny sort of way, let them do it. Let them go ahead. Let's have this, this fury happening across the country. But let's also say that what we're asking for is the involvement in recognising that the future requires that we make change sensibly and that we do it well, so that it survives. The future recognises that we, we don't start to re, reinvent the sort of 20th century zoning policies that related to a pre-global uh, warming uh, environment where people were encouraged to drive everywhere in cars and encouraged to, to keep. We also know that human beings now today, especially in the 21st century, do live differently. They, they do go out to occupy the suburbs to bring up children. Around where I live, I'm surprised by the number of retired people who have moved back in. If you ask 
Who lives in Centre Point? Who's bought those flats in Centre Point? It's quite remarkable how many of them are taken up by retired people who say, yeah, I'm going to move back into the city now. My, my, my duties to my family are over. My big house with all those bedrooms finished. I'm going to come back in. In other words, human beings, the population is understanding the changes in economic circumstances. The population are making moves which the government is still thinking 10 or 15 years in the past because it's just received a report which it commissioned 10 years ago and which is already 15 years out of date. <laughs> so what I'm saying for us is how we deal, what, what are what our worries in this? And how can we move forward? And what is the significance of the manifesto today? And it takes several, several areas. One is I believe that the public realm of course requires major improvements and important expenditures of money. But the most, one of the most significant places uh, that had a huge effect on me um, was a place that I went to in Denmark <coughs> called Kerr. And it's just a sort of west of Copenhagen. It's a little coastal town. And as we walked around, uh, it was an astonishing little place. Partly because uh, it's not a very grand place. The houses in it are mostly wooden, uh, and a lot of them are very small. But we walked around, and we thought that we walked into, I suppose, what a modern architect would call the Disneyfication of the world. <laughs> but let's just say it was an impeccably maintained part of the world. What was also fascinating was that as an experiment, a planning experiment, a community they had done away in Kona, which was essentially an 18th century um, town, uh, with all traffic instructions. <laughs> there were no, uh, no lines or structures. There were no um, uh, parking meters. There were no parking bays or yellow lines or disabled parking bays of any kind. The, the streets, um, one of the things that amuses me, the thing that possibly um, a, a visitor from uh, uh, <laughs> 50 years ago, we find the most important thing is the sort of colour that's daubed all over London streets. We've taken it as a, sort of, as a sort of thing that happens. And how much of it is ever paid attention to or is necessary, I have no idea. But our streets become sort of glaring rainbow of signage, which is actually quite difficult to follow. What's interesting, though, is that this in Kerner, they've done away with everything. And as a result, people drive cars in. They do drive into it. But almost instantly slow down to two miles an hour. And as they drive out, they think, I'm never driving in there again. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had a couple of Terry Farrells put a little bit in near us around the London University, which has a similar sort of effect. Um, um, I live on a, a, a pedestrianised square where they took the roads out. And maybe once every... I'm talking about once a fortnight, once a month, uh, somebody charges into the square and a mad person zooms around it at 30 miles an hour and looks incredibly dangerous to everybody who's, who's, who's in the square. But generally, what's happening by default, by community action, by a sense of just allowing it to happen almost, um, the centre part, nobody in, in their right mind gets into a car and tries to drive very much from north to south through Seller. It would take you the best part of an hour and a half. I've, occasionally, I've left my house. I did it the other day. I was going to an oldie, oldie lunch to, to publicise my book, which I'll plug in a minute. And uh, <laughs> I was just, and I was just, I rushed out of the house, but I thought, God, I'm going to be late. I jumped in a taxi. After I'd spent half an hour sitting in Gower Street, I thought, wait a minute, I'll get out of the taxi. I wish that I'd done what was the most sensible thing to do, which was to get on the tube. But the point is, the point is that the, the, the reason why it's like that is because of civic amenity society action in conjunction with council plan. Not, not just the council on its own. The original plan for that part of London was to drive a six lane motor down the top. <coughs> and that's why Centre Point is called Centre Point. The process was going to be that London would be this Victorian city 
as it was known, this unplanned and rather hateful sprawl of, of inconsequential sort of um, overcrowded building, which is, was really felt that way in the late 50s and early 60s, could be swept away if only we could put some really major motorways into it. The West Way exists, <laughs> we all like the West Way, but the idea that somehow in those days that you could drive thousands of cars an hour to sort of debouch under centre point and then where do you put them? <laughs> well, I can tell you, you don't. In this part of central London, there's no huge car parks. There's nobody saying, there's no traffic engineers or council saying, wait a minute, let's knock all this area down and put some more car parks. If we don't have the car parks, people won't come. And in fact, there's no sense in central London of anybody really trying to replan this city. It has evolved that way. And another thing that's really important about the area of central London that I live in, and that was quite late in government, is that you go onto any major street, Oxford Street or, uh, or uh, 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 Slane Square, and you're within 20 yards, people living. You're, you know, it's always been the same. People live in central London. There's a big movement now, everybody saying, this is phenomenally terrible for London, that all the foreigners have bought up all the houses in London, and these great rich foreigners are not even living there. I mean, if you're talking about houses which are selling for 146 million or whatever it is, these flats, there are about 2,000 of us. There are 8 million people living in London. It's as stupid to sit down and start talking about the 2,000 odd or the 3,000 odd people who have bought really expensive houses in a funny sort of way as it is to talk about the immigrants being responsible for the downfall of our country. In a funny sort of way, we are not, we're missing the point. The point is that these places where people live are effectively the future of our cities. And all places where people live need to be worthwhile and good and have people wanting to live there because not only are there good houses there but there are good facilities there. The public realm is good. It, it, you don't have run down slum areas. The reason why um, I, I got involved uh, a long time ago in issues of public realm, now, I started with a building as many people do. Many people get involved in the conservation movement because there's something like this wonderful hall that they want to help. And at grassroots, that is the most important thing that we are doing, that individuals are doing, is actually literally improving, improving the public realm by taking buildings, looking at them and saying, yeah, this building can be saved. And of course, it's a phenomenal effort. Anybody who's done it knows that it feels a Sisyphean task pushing this boulder uphill to get something restored, to raise money. That it can be done. And that when we were working in the Hackney Empire, we had no idea how many people were doing it. That amenity societies across Britain are working for their own street or square or area. I remember I went to speak to the Heath and Hampstead Society. They were extremely proud of themselves because they're the earliest conservation group, the earliest, felt to be the earliest civic society, starting up in 1831. My frontages committee in Fitzroy Square first met in 1808. <laughs> we outrank them. All right, we're only dealing with a square. But all those amenity societies are vital. At one level, it could be as much as painting the railings. And those things, if you're not looking after the details, then you're not looking after the big picture. So I always think that when we start with this manifesto, if we say that we talk about public realm and how important public realm is, all planning starts at the front gate. It starts at the gate. The, the planning arguments are arguments between neighbour and neighbour. And so the sense of being involved in your area, knowing your area, having an audit of your area, protesting about things, doing all that work that civic societies do, which is checking out on planning applications, all those things are vital. They are absolutely to do with the idea of preservation. And it's terribly, terribly important that they continue and we become proud of what we do and not, uh, not allow the sort of slightly the, the, the negative vibe that you get. We've organised this year a series 
of dinners in which we invited journalists because I feel very strongly that our message is not quite reaching a wider world, the, the, the world, the organisation, the societies, and what, what they're achieving. And I was slightly taken aback by the attitude of some of the people that were there. Some of the people sort of had no idea that we existed. They didn't quite really understand that, that there'd been a transition from civic trust to civic voice. They, they said, you should ally yourselves with civic trust. <laughs> and Freddie had to explain that actually we are civic trust. <laughs> so we have a job to do to explain what it is that we do. We also, for the second part of the manifesto, so to involve ourselves in the public realm, to care about the public realm, it seems to me, is vital to what we do. And it's vital that we understand that that involves slog and hard work that people do. It involves also, if you like, um, saving buildings, but also involving ourselves in local plans. Because as we know, what, what we're trying to do at the moment is find a way of making sure that the voices of amenity societies are heard. So the second part of the manifesto, which, which says that we must find a way of bringing amenity societies together, is, I think, part of convincing those journalists. It's part of making sure that all the amenity centres, uh, the societies, try and gather under one banner and one manifesto if we can. And, what, and, 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 and this is the most complicated thing. As I've often said, the campaign for the preservation of rural England does what it says on the team. It's a, it's, we love rural England and we're going to campaign to preserve it. And if you want to join that banner, that sums it up. We, by nature, in the civic movement, have to deal with the detail of distinctiveness. With the huge variety of local uh, variations. That's what we stand for, effectively. I mean, one street in any borough has its own qualities and its own problems and its own needs of preservation, which are slightly different from other streets. The centre of Canterbury is actually, seriously, not exactly the same as the centre of Harlem. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, and yet, I have been to a meeting, uh, which we were invited to attend, um, where we discussed, where we, we almost fell into a little bit of an argument about Canterbury itself, because I'd said how important it was and how difficult it was for cities in Britain, some of which are victims of their own success, and some are facing decay. And they don't represent the same problem, but we have a centralised new planning directive which treats all identical. And a need to understand that the reason why the Earth March called English heritage and a lot of heritage bodies together was because he felt that, as somebody who's interested involved in Chichester, that not enough attention was made in the planning framework to the distinct problems that historic cities have compared with cities which, which uh, have a different agenda. Cities which, if you like, are tourists. I claimed, I said that, you know, tourism at that stage can be a double-edged sword, can bring people in and cause sort of pressures on, on what we love and what's, what's respected. Uh, Simon Jenkins made a passionate plea for the fact that uh, without, you know, he said there are many towns in Britain that wish they had Canterbury's problems. And I can understand that theory as well. He also made a passionate plea for the idea that it's very difficult to argue in conservation if you can't argue economic value for it, that you lose the argument at government level because there, there are too many um, uh, politicians and councillors who say, you know, no, 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 we all, well, it's nice what you're talking about, it's mere idealism. We need facts and figures. My argument is, if we live by statistics, we can also fall by statistics. Because there have to be values. We have to understand what those values are and try and define those values. Because without defining those values, we effectively open ourselves to a numbers game, which can be difficult to win. Because who's to say that um, uh, uh, a massive uh, 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 a new um, uh, town centre shopping uh, uh, centre and, and clearing the area to have that 
isn't a better numbers game than the numbers game of preserving what's there because we believe in the long term that is the future of Britain and what people really want. So with the second element of the manifesto, what I think uh, is important in amongst all this uh, uh, state of affairs, which you will be discussing over the next over the next weekend, the idea that that within this um, new planning framework and advocacy of localism, we have to sort out what that means. What I also think it means for us is that we have to be aware of our putative constituents. We have to try and bring everybody in. I was rather surprised when I became involved in neighbourhood forums in a central London area how strongly the passions ran between who controlled what <laughs> amongst the immediate societies in the area. I, I had to say, look, I'm just the broker. And we had a public meeting and 150 people turned up and another civic society said that was unfair. <laughs> and I said, I was pretty taken back. I said, how do you mean? They said, you're having public meetings. <laughs> <laughs> we have done so much work. We've done so much work. We are the force here, and we have been for the last 40 years. How dare you sort of try to turn this into a sort of uh, a, a exercise in demagoguery under the influence of a celebrity? <laughs> and I thought this was a peculiar state of affairs, if you don't mind me saying something, for a civic society to find itself in. Because if there is going to be an argument about who represents whom, then we have to represent as many people as possible. And public meetings are an essential part of that. And part of being there for the public is trying to show that the work that we do is not only essential and involving and requires work on the local plan, but it also requires enjoyment, fun, and heart. And commitment from the heart. <laughs> and commitment. <laughs> Yes. 
1960s, we used to pledge ourselves to the little red book.